Hello friends, I welcome you to the continuation in this calm reading of Emma. Tonight I shall be reading for you Volume 2, Chapter 6 and 7. Find yourself a place where you can safely relax. Perhaps your bed or a comfortable chair. Settle into that place. Take a deep breath and feel yourself unwind. And let us begin these chapters. Volume 2, Chapter 6 The next morning brought Mr. Frank Churchill again. He came with Mrs. Weston, to whom and to Highbury he seemed to take very cordially. He had been sitting with her. It appeared most companionably at home, till her usual hour of exercise, and on being desired to choose their walk immediately fixed on Highbury. He did not doubt there being very pleasant walks in every direction, but if left to him he should always choose the same. Highbury, that airy, cheerful, happy-looking Highbury, would be his constant attraction. Highbury, with Mrs. Weston, stood for Hartfield, and she trusted to its bearing the same construction with him. They walked thither directly. Emma had hardly expected them, for Mr. Weston, who had called in for half a minute, in order to hear that his son was very handsome, knew nothing of their plans. And it was an agreeable surprise to her, therefore, to perceive them walking up to the house together, arm in arm. She was wanting to see him again, and especially to see him in company with Mrs. Weston, upon his behavior to whom her opinion of him was to depend. If he were deficient there, nothing should make amends for it. But on seeing them together, she became perfectly satisfied. It was not merely in fine words or hyperbolic compliment that he paid his duty. Nothing could be more proper or pleasing than his whole manner to her. Nothing could more agreeably denote his wish of considering her as a friend and securing her affection and there was time enough for Emma to form a reasonable judgment. As their visit included all the rest of the morning, they were all three walking about together for an hour or two, first round the shrubbies of Hartfield, and afterwards in Highbury. He was delighted with everything, admired Hartfield sufficiently for Mrs. Woodhouse's ear, and when their going farther was resolved on, confessed his wish to be made acquainted with the whole village, and found matter of commendation and interest much oftener than Emma could have supposed. Some of the objects of his curiosity spoke very amiable feelings. He begged to be shown the house which his father had lived in so long, and which had been the home of his father's father and on recollecting that an old woman who had nursed him was still living, walked in quest of her cottage from one end of the street to the other. And though in some points of pursuit or observation there was no positive merit, they showed, altogether, a good will towards Highbury, in general, which must be very like a merit to those he was with. Emma watched and decided that with such feelings as were now shown, it could not be fairly supposed that he had been ever voluntarily absenting himself, that he had not been acting a part or making a parade of insincere professions, and that Mr. Knightley certainly had not done him justice. The first pause was at the Crown Inn, an inconsiderable house, though the principal one of the sort, where a couple of pair of post-horses were kept, more for the convenience of the neighborhood than from any run on the road. 
and his companions had not expected to be detained by any interest excited there. But in passing it, they gave the history of the large room visibly added. It had been built many years ago for a ballroom, and while the neighborhood had been in a particularly populous dancing state, had been occasionally used as such, but such brilliant days had long passed away. And now the highest purpose for which it was ever wanted was to accommodate a whist club, established among the gentlemen and half-gentlemen of the place. He was immediately interested. Its character as a ballroom caught him, and instead of passing on, he stopped for several minutes at the two superior sashed windows which were open, to look in and contemplate its capabilities, and lament that its original purpose should have ceased. He saw no fault in the room. He could acknowledge none which they suggested. No, it was long enough, broad enough, handsome enough. It would hold the very number for comfort. They ought to have balls there at least every fortnight through the winter. Why had not Miss Woodhouse revived the former good old days of the room? So, she, who could do anything in Highbury. The want of proper families in the place, and the conviction that none beyond the place and its immediate environs could be tempted to attend, were mentioned. But he was not satisfied. He could not be persuaded that so many good-looking houses, as he saw around him, could not furnish numbers enough for such a meeting. And even when particulars were given and families described, he was still unwilling to admit that the inconvenience of such a mixture would be anything, or that there would be the smallest difficulty in everybody's returning into their proper place the next morning. He argued like a young man very much bent on dancing, and Emma was rather surprised to see the constitution of the Western prevail so decidedly against the habits of the Churchills. He seemed to have all the life and spirit, cheerful feelings and social inclinations of his father, and nothing of the pride or reserve of Enscombe. Of pride, indeed, there was, perhaps, scarcely enough, his indifference to a confusion of rank bordered too much on inelegance of mind. He could be no judge, however, of the evil he was holding cheap. It was but an effusion of lively spirit. At last he was persuaded to move on from the front of the crown, and being now almost facing the house where the Bateses lodged, Emma recollected his intended visit the day before and asked him if he had paid it. Yes, oh yes, he replied. I was just going to mention it, a very successful visit. I saw all the three ladies, and felt very much obliged to you for your preparatory hint. If the talking aunt had taken me quite by surprise, it must have been the death of me. As it was, I was only betrayed into paying a most unreasonable visit. Ten minutes would have been all that was necessary, perhaps all that was proper, and I had told my father I should certainly be at home before him. But there was no getting away, no pause. And, to my utter astonishment, I found, when he, finding me nowhere else, joined me there at last, that I had been actually sitting with them very nearly three-quarters of an hour. The good lady had not given me the possibility of escape before. And how did you think Miss Fairfax looking? Ill, very ill. That is, if a young lady can ever be allowed to look ill. But the expression is hardly admissible, Mrs. Weston, is it? Ladies can never look ill, and seriously, Miss Fairfax is naturally so pale as almost always to give the appearance of ill health a most deplorable want of complexion. Emma would not agree to this, and began a warm defense of Miss Fairfax's complexion. 
It was certainly never brilliant, but she would not allow it to have a sickly hue in general, and there was a softness and delicacy in her skin which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face. He listened with all due deference, acknowledged that he had heard many people say the same, but yet he must confess that to him nothing could make amends for the want of the fine glow of health. Where features were indifferent, a fine complexion gave beauty to them all. And where they were good, the effect was, fortunately, he need not to attempt to describe what the effect was. Well, said Emma, there is no disputing about the taste. At least you admire her, except her complexion. He shook his head and laughed. I cannot separate Miss Fairfax and her complexion. Did you see her often at Weymouth? Were you often in the same society? At this moment they were approaching forts, and he hastily exclaimed, Ha! This must be the very shop that everybody attends every day of their lives, as my father informs me. He comes to Highbury himself, he says, six days out of the seven and has always business at forts. If it be not inconvenient to you, pray, let us go in, that I may prove myself to belong to the place, to be a true citizen of Highbury. I must buy something at forts. It will be taking out my freedom. I dare say, they sell gloves. Oh, yes, gloves and everything. I do admire your patriotism. You will be adored in Highbury. You were very popular before you came, because you were Mr. Weston's son. But lay out half a guinea at Ford's, and your popularity will stand upon your own virtues. They went in. And while the sleek, well-tied parcels of men's beavers and York tan were bringing down and displaying on the counter, he said, But I beg your pardon, Miss Woodhouse, you were speaking to me, you were saying something at the very moment of this burst of my amour patrie. Do not let me lose it. I assure you, the utmost stretch of public fame would not make me amends for the loss of any happiness in private life. I merely asked whether you had known much of Miss Fairfax and her party at Weymouth. And now that I understand your question, I must pronounce it to be a very unfair one. It is always the lady's right to decide on the degree of acquaintance. Miss Fairfax must already have given her account. I shall not commit myself by claiming more than she may choose to allow. Upon my word, you answer as discreetly as she could do herself. But her account of everything leaves so much to be guessed. She is so very reserved, so very unwilling to give the least information about anybody, that I really think you may say what you like of your acquaintance with her. May I indeed? Then I will speak the truth, and nothing suits me so well. I met her frequently at Weymouth. I had known the Campbells a little in town, and at Weymouth we were very much in the same set. Colonel Campbell is a very agreeable man, and Mrs. Campbell a friendly, warm-hearted woman. I like them all. You know Miss Fairfax's situation in life, I conclude, what she is destined to be. Yes, rather hesitatingly, I believe I do. You get upon delicate subjects, Emma, said Mr. Weston, smiling. Remember that I am here. Mr. Frank Churchill hardly knows what to say when you speak of Miss Fairfax's situation in life. I will move a little farther off. I certainly do forget to think of her, said Emma, as having ever been anything but my friend, and my dearest friend. He looked as if he fully understood and honored such a sentiment. When the gloves were bought, and they had quitted the shop again. Did you ever hear the young lady we were speaking of play? 
said Frank Churchill. Ever hear her? repeated Emma. You forget how much she belongs to Highbury. I have heard her every year of our lives since we both began. She plays charmingly. You think so, do you? I wanted the opinion of someone who could really judge. She appeared to me to play well, that is, with considerable taste, but I know nothing of the matter myself. I am excessively fond of music, but without the smallest skill or right of judgment of anybody's performance. I have been used to hear hers admired, and I remember one proof of her being taught to play well. A man, a very musical man, and in love with another woman, engaged to her on the point of marriage. He would yet never ask that other woman to sit down to the instrument, if the lady in question could sit down instead. Never seemed to like to hear one if he could hear the other. That, I thought, in a man of known musical talent, was some proof. Proof indeed, said Emma, highly amused. Mr. Dixon is very musical, is he? We shall know more about them all in half an hour from you than Miss Fairfax would have vouchsafed in half a year. Yes, Mr. Dixon and Miss Campbell were the persons, and I thought it a very strong proof. Certainly very strong it was, to own the truth, a great deal stronger than if I had been Miss Campbell would have been at all agreeable to me. I could not excuse a man's having more music than love, more ear than I, a more acute sensibility to fine sounds than to my feelings. How did Miss Campbell appear to like it? It was her very particular friend, you know. Poor comfort, said Emma, laughing. One would rather have a stranger preferred than one's very particular friend. With a stranger it might not occur again, but the misery of having a very particular friend always at hand, to do everything better than one does oneself. Poor Mrs. Dixon. Well, I am glad she is gone to settle in Ireland. You are right. It was not very flattering of Miss Campbell, but she really did not seem to feel it. So much the better, or so much the worse, I don't know which. But be it sweetness or be it stupidity in her, quickness of friendship or dullness of feeling, there was one person, I think, who must have felt it, Miss Fairfax herself. She must have felt the improper and dangerous distinction. As to that, I do not. Oh, do not imagine that I expect an account of Miss Fairfax's sensation from you, or from anybody else. They are known to no human being, I guess, but herself. But if she continued to play whenever she was asked by Mr. Dixon, one may guess what one chooses. There appeared such a perfectly good understanding among them all. He began rather quickly, but checking himself at it. However, it is impossible for me to say on what terms they really were, how it might all be behind the scenes. I can only say that there was smoothness outwardly, but you, who have known Miss Fairfax from a child, must be a better judge of her character, and how she is likely to conduct herself in critical situations than I can be. I have known her from a child, undoubtedly, we have been children and women together, and it is natural to suppose that we should be intimate, that we should have taken to each other whenever she visited her friends. But we never did. I hardly know how it has happened, a little, perhaps, from the wickedness on my side, which was prone to take disgust towards a girl so idolized and so cried up as she always was, by her aunt and grandmother and all their set and then her reserve. I never could attach myself to anyone so completely reserved. It is a most repulsive quality indeed, said he. Oftentimes very convenient, no doubt, but never pleasing. There is a safety in reserve, but no attraction. 
one cannot love a reserved person. Not till the reserve ceases towards oneself, and then the attraction may be the greater. But I must be more in want of a friend, or an agreeable companion than I have yet been, to take the trouble of conquering anybody's reserve to procure one. Intimacy between Miss Fairfax and me is quite out of the question. I have no reason to think ill of her, not the least, except that such extreme and perpetual cautiousness of word and manner, such a dread of giving a distinct idea about anybody, is apt to suggest suspicions of there being something to conceal. He perfectly agreed with her, and, after walking together so long, and thinking so much alike, Emma felt herself so well acquainted with him that she should hardly believe it to be only their second meeting. He was not exactly what she had expected. Less of the man of the world in some of his notions, less of the spoiled child of fortune, but therefore better than she had expected. His ideas seemed more moderate, his feelings warmer. She was particularly struck by his manner of considering Mr. Elton's house, which, as well as the church, he would go and look at, and would not join them in finding much fault with. No, he could not believe it a bad house. Not such a house as a man was to be pitied for having. If it were to be shared with the woman he loved, he could not think any man to be pitied for having that house. There must be ample room in it for every real comfort. The man must be a blockhead who wanted more. Mrs. Weston laughed, and said he did not know what he was talking about. Used only to a large house himself, without her, and without ever thinking how many advantages and accommodations were attached to its size, he could be no judge of the privations inevitably belonging to a small one. But Emma, in her own mind, determined that he did know what he was talking about, and that he showed a very amiable inclination to settle early in life, and to marry, from worthy motives. He might not be aware of the inroads on domestic peace, to be occasioned by no housekeeper's room, or a bad butler's pantry. But no doubt, he did perfectly feel that Anscombe could not make him happy, and that whenever he were attached, he would willingly give up much wealth to be allowed an early establishment. Chapter 7 Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day by hearing that he was gone off to London, merely to have his hair cut. A sudden freak seemed to have seized him at breakfast, and he had sent for a chase and set off, intending to return to dinner, but with no more important view that appeared than having his hair cut. And there was certainly no harm in his travelling sixteen miles twice over on such an errand but there was an air of foppery and nonsense in it, which she could not approve. It did not accord with the rationality of plan, the moderation in expense, or even the unselfish warmth of heart, which she had believed herself to discern in him yesterday. Vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper, which must be doing something, good or bad. Heedlessness as to the pleasure of his father and Mrs. Weston, indifferent as to how his conduct might appear in general, he became liable to all these charges. His father only called him a coxcomb, and thought it a very good story, but that Mrs. Weston did not like it was clear enough. By her passing it over as quickly as possible, and making no other comment than that all young people would have their little whims. With the exception of this little blot, Emma found that his visit hitherto had given her friend only good ideas of him. 
Uh, Mrs. Weston was very ready to say how attentive and pleasant a companion he made himself, how much he saw to like in his disposition altogether. He appeared to have a very open temper, certainly a very cheerful and lively one. She could observe nothing wrong in his notions, a great deal decidedly right. He spoke of his uncle with warm regard, was fond of talking of him, said he would be the best man in the world if he were left to himself. And, though there was no being attached to the aunt, he acknowledged her kindness with gratitude, and seemed to mean always to speak of her with respect. This was all very promising, and, but for such an unfortunate fancy for having his hair cut, there was nothing to denote him unworthy of the distinguished honor which her imagination had given him. The honor, if not of being really in love with her, of being at least very near it, and saved only by her own indifference, for still her resolution held of never marrying, the honor, in short, of being marked out for her by all their joint acquaintance. Mr. Weston, on his side, added a virtue to the account which must have some weight. He gave her to understand that Frank admired her extremely, thought her very beautiful and very charming, and with so much to be said for him altogether. She found she must not judge him harshly. As Mrs. Weston observed, all young people would have their little whims. There was one person among his new acquaintance in Surrey, not so leniently disposed. In general he was judged, throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, with great candor. Liberal allowances were made for the little excesses of such a handsome young man, one who smiled so often and bowed so well. But there was one spirit among them, not to be softened from its power of censure by bows or smiles. Mr. Knightley. The circumstance was told him at Hartfield. For the moment he was silent, but Emma heard him almost immediately afterwards say to himself, over a newspaper he held in his hand, Ha! Just the trifling, silly fellow I took him for. She had half a mind to resent, but an instant's observation convinced her that it was really said only to relieve his own feelings and not meant to provoke, and therefore she let it pass. Although, in one instance, the bearers of not good tidings, Mr. and Mrs. Weston's visit this morning was in another respect particularly opportune. Something occurred while they were at Hartfield to make Emma want their advice, and which was still more lucky she wanted exactly the advice they gave. This was the occurrence. The Coles had been settled some years in Highbury, and were very good sort of people, friendly, liberal, and unpretending. But, on the other hand, they were of low origin, in trade, and only moderately genteel. On their first coming into the country, they had lived in proportion to their income, quietly keeping little company, and that little unexpensively. But that last year or two had brought them a considerable increase of means. The house in town had yielded greater profits, and fortune in general had smiled on them. With their wealth their views increased, their want of a larger house, their inclination for more company. They added to the house, to their number of servants, to their expenses of every sort and by this time were, in fortune and style of living, second only to the family at Hartfield. Their love of society and the new dining-room prepared everybody for their keeping dinner company, and a few parties, chiefly among the single men, had already taken place. The regular and best families, Emma could hardly suppose they would presume to invite neither Donwell, nor Hartfield, nor Randolph's. Nothing should tempt her to go, if they did. 
and she regretted that her father's known habits would be giving her refusal less meaning than she could wish. The colds were very respectable in their way, but they ought to be taught that it was not for them to arrange the terms on which the superior families would visit them. This lesson she very much feared they would receive only from herself. She had little hope of Mr. Knightley, none of Mr. Weston. But she had made up her mind how to meet this presumption so many weeks before it appeared that when the insult came at last, it found her very differently affected. Donwell and Randalls had received the invitation, and none had come for her father and herself, and Mrs. Weston's accounting for it with, I suppose they will not take the liberty with you. They know you do not dine out, was not quite sufficient. She felt that she should like to have had the power of refusal, and afterwards, as the idea of the party to be assembled there, consisting precisely of those whose society was dearest to her, occurred again and again, she did not know that she might not have been tempted to accept. Harriet was to be there in the evening at the Bateses. They had been speaking of it as they walked about Highbury the day before and Frank Churchill had most earnestly lamented her absence. Might not the evening end in a dance? Had been a question of his. The bare possibility of it acted as a farther irritation on her spirits. And her being left in solitary grandeur, even supposing the omission to be intended as a compliment, was but poor comfort. It was the arrival of this very invitation while the Westons were at Hartfield, which made their presence so acceptable, for though her first remark on reading it was that, of course it must be declined, she so very soon proceeded to ask them what they advised her to do, that their advice for her going was most prompt and successful. She owned that, Considering everything, she was not absolutely without inclination for the party. The coals expressed themselves so properly, and there was so much real attention in the manner of it, so much consideration for her father. They would have solicited the honour earlier, but had been waiting the arrival of a folding screen from London, which they hoped might keep Mr. Woodhouse from any draught of air and therefore induce him the more readily to give them the honour of his company. Upon the whole, she was very persuadable, and, it being briefly settled among themselves, how it might be done without neglecting his comfort, how certainly Mrs. Goddard, if not Mrs. Bates, might be depended on for bearing him company. Mr. Woodhouse was to be talked into an acquiescence of his daughter's going out to dinner on a day now near at hand, and spending the whole evening away from him. And for his going, Emma did not wish him to think it possible. The hours would be too late, and the party too numerous. He was soon pretty well resigned. I am not fond of dinner visiting, said he, I never was, no more is Emma. Late hours do not agree with us. I am sorry Mr. and Mrs. Cole should have done it. I think it would be much better if they would come in the afternoon next summer, and take their tea with us, take us in their afternoon walk, which they might do as our hours are so reasonable, and yet get home without being out in the damp of the evening." The dews of a summer evening are what I would not expose anybody to. However, as they are so very desirous to have dear Emma dine with them, and as you will both be there, and Mr. Knightley too, to take care of her, I cannot wish to prevent it, provided the weather be what it ought, neither damp, nor cold, nor windy. Then, turning to Mrs. Weston, with a look of gentle reproach. Ah, Miss Taylor, if you had not married, you would have stayed at home with me. Well, sir, cried Mr. Weston, as I took Miss Taylor away, 
it is incumbent on me to supply her place if I can. And I will step to Mrs. Goddard in a moment if you wish it. But the idea of anything to be done in a moment was increasing, not lessening, Mr. Woodhouse's agitation. The ladies knew better how to allay it. Mr. Weston must be quiet, and everything deliberately arranged. With this treatment, Mr. Woodhouse was soon composed enough for talking as usual. He should be happy to see Mrs. Goddard. He had a great regard for Mrs. Goddard, and Emma should write a line and invite her. James could take the note, but first of all, there must be an answer written to Mrs. Cole. You will make my excuses, my dear, as civilly as possible. You will say that I am quite an invalid, and go nowhere, and therefore must decline the obliging invitation, beginning with my compliments, of course. But you will do everything right. I need not tell you what is to be done. We must remember to let James know that the carriage will be wanted on Tuesday. I shall have no fears for you with him. We have never been there above once since the new approach was made. But still I have no doubt that James will take you very safely. And when you get there, you must tell him at what time you would have him come for you again. And you had better name an early hour. You will not like staying late. You will get very tired when tea is over. But you would not wish me to come away before I am tired, Papa. Oh, no, my love, but you will soon be tired. There will be a great many people talking at once. You will not like the noise. But, my dear sir, cried Mr. Weston, if Emma comes away early, it will be breaking up the party. And no great harm if it does, said Mr. Woodhouse. The sooner every party breaks up, the better. But you do not consider how it may appear to the coals. Emma's going away directly after tea might be giving offence. They are good-natured people, and think little of their own claims, but still they must feel that anybody's hurrying away is no great compliment. And Miss Woodhouse's doing it would be more thought of than any other person's in the room. You would not wish to disappoint and mortify the calls, I am sure, sir. Friendly, good sort of people as ever lived, and who have been your neighbors these ten years. No, upon no account in the world, Mr. Weston, I am much obliged to you for reminding me. I should be extremely sorry to give them any pain. I know what worthy people they are. Perry tells me that Mr. Cole never touches malt liquor. You would not think it to look at him, but he is bilious. Mr. Cole is very bilious. No, I would not be the means of giving them any pain. My dear Emma, we must consider this. I am sure, rather than run the risk of hurting Mr. and Mrs. Cole, you would stay a little longer than you might wish. You will not regard being tired. You will be perfectly safe, you know, among our friends. Oh, yes, Papa, I have no fears at all for myself, and I should have no scruples of staying as late as Mrs. Weston, but on your account. I am only afraid of your sitting up for me. I am not afraid of your not being exceedingly comfortable with Mrs. Goddard. She loves piquet, you know, but when she is gone home, I am afraid you will be sitting up by yourself, instead of going to bed at your usual time and the idea of that would entirely destroy my comfort. You must promise me not to set up. He did, on the condition of some promises on her side, such as that if she came home cold, she would be sure to warm herself thoroughly, if hungry, that she would take something to eat, that her own maid should sit up for her, and that Sal and the butler should see that everything were safe in the house as usual.